hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatizing the fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnetic plays, we urge you only seriously to turn off your way now. Rupert who? <laughs> Rupert Orange, of course. Whatever became of Rupert Orange? At every society party in London, in New York, anywhere, such a question was once asked frequently. Now, not so often. Soon it will never be asked again, because people forget people. Public figures fade into insignificance. Great stars of the stage and screen are forgotten all too easily, and heroes we might owe our lives to could die in rags for all we care within a few short years of their exploits. Rupert Orange. Rupert Orange was no hero, of course. He starred on no stage, although he was at one time a familiar figure at London first nights, and would never have dreamt of attending if a box had not been available. A box meant a beautiful woman... And whether the play was good or bad, the evening required food and wine at its end. Rupert Orange blazed like a comet for a few short, brilliant years. But when his name slipped from memory in the early thirties, there were precious few to mourn a man who had gone forever beyond midnight. Biotech, the new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight. Don't stare, Colin. It's rude. Does my appearance surprise you? No, Countess, not at all. You're looking remarkably... I think you look... You're a liar. I received your letter. <laughs> Why should you want to know about Rupert Orange? I met him once or twice, Countess. He fascinated me. And I thought you, of all people... Uh, <laughs> forgive me, but... Uh... <laughs> On one condition. What? You write nothing, you publish nothing, you say nothing until after my death. You understand? All right. Rupert Orange... He was the most beautiful man I have ever seen. That includes your film stars, too. Rupert Orange. Sometimes in the night I wake up because I think I feel it lived on mine. But it's only a dream. Only a dream. <laughs> Countess de Volnay, whose notorious connection with Rupert Orange once filled the society pages of the newspapers and magazines of the world, died in New York a month ago. This is the story as she told me. She swears it's true. <laughs> and then, and then, of course, then. Rupert, Rupert, I've got to talk to you a few minutes, please. Important man. My dear boy, have you met that little one, that little girl? Listen, oh. Rupert, are you drunk? Listen, old boy, I'll knock your blasted head off. No, my blasted nothing off. Listen. 
News. I've got some news for you. You'd better know now. No news is good news. This isn't good news. Then it's bad news, then. It's bad news. What? I had it from Peter Starkey. He says Mrs. Annie's is going to win. Rubbish. The man's raving. She Mrs. Annie's has engaged someone brilliant. Someone Starkey says your man won't be able to touch. They'll prove your aunt died lunatic. Look. Lu- my aunt... He says you'd better mar- muster all your resources now because he thinks you're going to lose. Listen, my aunt died and she left me everything. Her entire estate. This, this contest is nonsense. Mrs. Annis is a fool. She hasn't a chance. She's only the wife of the Earl. Aunt Beryl didn't even like her. The courts will decide that the old lady was unduly influenced. Starkey swears they'll decide Rupert. she was mad and... Darling, come oh, on. Shut up. She wasn't there. Starkey, Starkey says they'll find her me. testament void. Starkey says, Starkey says. He's only jealous because I didn't offer him the brief. I win hands down. My name's Rupert Orange. Who's Mrs. Annis? <sighs> Come and have a drink. You'll find, dear boy, that people who inquire what's in a name are always people without a name themselves. Mrs. Annis will not win. Now, let's hear no more. Unfortunately, the Moor takes little notice of names. Rupert Orange meant a lot to London's brightly lit places. He spent money in them, but he meant nothing to the law. In the case of the will of his late aunt, Rupert Orange lost. It was proven that the old lady had died insane, and that she had been unduly influenced. Mrs. Annis and her husband leapt suddenly into great wealth. Orange, once his debts were paid, fell from opulence to poverty... And there is no worse fall than that. It hurts. It disgraces. You see, he never really worked. And was such a stranger to the phenomenon that he really had no idea how to go about it. It's amazing. One writes verses, articles, stories. And when one is an amateur in writing for pleasure, for fun, everyone swears they are magnificent, darling. Now I'm trying to do it for a living, trying to make my blasted pen a breadwinner. (laughs) Nobody's remotely interested I'll probably starve to death. I'm perfectly resigned to it. And if what you tell me is true about all these editor fellows, I think... Well, one of them the other day, I'd been waiting for the best part of an hour. This... I think you ought to forget about writing. I've seen right? clever articles. Really clever. Better than half the muck one sees in the glossy magazines. I'm going to paper my wall with rejection slips. Except my wall's damp. It'll probably all peel off again. you better pull yourself together, Rupert. The hilarious thing is... You know how many people cut me now? Rupert who? Merely because I can't throw cash around. Well, it'll be the making of you. Don't talk like that, Clive. Nonsense. Poverty's disgusting. It has no value. It degrades. My only doubt about poverty is whether the rumor of poverty being good for one is put about by the rich to keep the poor from their doors, or whether the poor and rich should tell the lie to give themselves some excuse for being and remaining alive. Poverty. <laughs> I really am. The other day I was actually hungry, do you know that? And I really had to work out whether I could afford a meal or not. Me? Listen, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You've got to find work. I will. And if I can help in some way that you do, you've really got to. No, no, I don't like borrowing. I mean, no, something is going to happen. Something will turn up. You'll see. Something did turn up, too. Although it would have been better if Rupert Orange had never walked on the embankment that night. Along by the river, by the fairground near the Black River. It would have been better if Rupert Orange had never been born. Don't like fairgrounds, then, eh? I beg your pardon? Noisy, eh? Yes. Mm. Good evening. Walk a while with you, if you don't mind. If you wish. Rupert was content to have the old fellow tag along. They walked in silence for a mile or so. With a kind of man, one that's never done anything in the world and never will do anything, a certain kind of man who believes that distant relations and even total strangers 
are apt at any moment to fling fortunes into their hands. Rupert Orange was like that. They wandered up to the West End. The two of them stood for a while watching the crowds pouring out of the theatres. The well-dressed, well-fed crowds. Hailing taxis, making plans, race meetings, bridge parties, holidays. The First World War was well over, and the Second was still well round the corner. The world seemed good, but not to Orange. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Believe you're crying, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, come in here. Hot drinks, what you need. Feel the cold, I've no doubt. Yes, cold. He's cold. Yes. Come here. Come on. Italy. Uh, yes. Mm. Upset about something, aren't you? Upset about something, yes. Here you were. Mm. Ah. Wealth. Hmm? Wealth. The only thing worth striving for in this world. The only thing worth striving for. Your tub philosophers may laugh at it. They may laugh at it, but they only laugh to keep envy and desire away. Yes. Let any man you call a genius arrive at the biggest and best hotel in London tonight and let a millionaire arrive at the same moment and I bet you the millionaire gets the attention every time. The millionaire every time. Yes, millionaire. Ah. I agree with you, my friend. Money counts for a great deal. Great deal. <laughs> great deal. Uh, two more hot teas, if you please. Uh, what have you got instead, eh? Music? Art? Ah. Go into any studio tomorrow and ask the artist who he'll see first. You or a man with a chick in his hand. If a poor man has the brains of Will Shakespeare and is splashed with mud from a motor car driven by a wealthy woman, the only answer to his protest would be a policeman's move on. Yes. I know. I know. Fifty times better than you, I know. And it's worse for me because I once knew. If I once... But not anymore. Poor man. Plains of Shakespeare. Ah, mud. Ah, splashed. Ah, thank you. Yes, Plains of Shakespeare. But I'd sell my whole life now for one year's perfect enjoyment of real... What? I said I'd sell... I had you. Oh. Not one year, though. Five years. Hmm? Five years. Think of the glory of it. This evening, a despised pauper. Tomorrow, a rich man. Take courage, make up your mind to yield your life at the end of five years in exchange for riches. What? What are you talking about? Isn't it plain? Isn't it clear, isn't it? I promise, I pledge you, that tomorrow morning you should be in as sound a financial position as any man in London. No one here can love or understand. What are the stories they all have? And what, what, what do you want from me after, after five years? Your life. Your soul. your mind, you see? Brain of Shakespeare. Ah, splashed with mud. Ooh, mud. You're mad. Ah. Aren't you? This is a joke, you. You're joking. Not unless you think it's funny. Pulling my leg. Five years. Make up your mind. Who are you? Ah. This evening, pauper. Tomorrow... Ah, I'm sure to even listen. <laughs> anyway, how'd I... You'd 
don't want cash or anything. And now, uh, do you? Just uh, your word, spoken quietly, in full knowledge of what you are doing. What would I be doing? Selling your soul. Like Faustus and all that sort of thing? Uh, oh, really? <laughs> Stay where you are. In the gutter. No, no, wait a minute. Just, just wait. All right. Five years. All right. You have queer eyes. Queer. You look... Five years. No more. It's a lifetime. A short one. What do I... You will say... You know? If you were real. I know. If you were to be believed. I know. There is one more word. Health. What use is wealth if you are to drop dead in six months or be knocked down by a passing motor car? You shall be free from any physical pain for five years. I think I desire some... Slight ills, <laughs> if only to recognize the very sweetness of life without them. Your hand. One moment. Money. Health. Listen. 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 There is a woman alive in this city tonight who has brought me to the degradation you witness now. She flung me to the ground. She covered me with dust. She crushed me under her heel. Give her to me that I may lower her pride. Let me see her as abject and despised as the lowest troll that walks the streets. Your taste is very unusual. But, yes, this will be. That will be the sweetest part of the five years. Sweeter even than the wealth. Perhaps I should write the story of my meeting. When one third of London has electricity and the rest gas, I, Rupert Orange, have to make do with a candle. Oh, dear life. What it could be like if... The envelope lay just inside his door. It looked yellow in the candlelight. Mr. Orange, the estate of Henry Parsons of Falkenhauer, Georgia, the United States of America, has reached probate. If you will call at our Pine Street, London office, at your earliest convenience, you will learn something to your advantage. It makes you, Mr. Orange, a dollar millionaire. We didn't know when on earth you were coming back. Darling, I simply cannot tell you how we missed that jar, Mr. Orange. I don't wear that. Huh? Grotesque, really. Amid this social intercourse, Rupert decided on a meeting with Mrs. Annis. He left it for a few months. He enjoyed his new incredible wealth. It was not until an evening late in February that he took a cab to her house near Sloan Square. My dear, dear Rupert, how glad I am to see you. My dear, it's so long, I thought we were never going to see you again. But I'm so glad. And how very fortunate that the legacy was for you. I was quite delighted when I heard of it. And my husband, too. Oh, no, he's lost. <laughs> 
<laughs> I suppose there's not the slightest possibility of a flaw in the will? Oh, no. I think it's all right. This time. I see. They stared at one another, these two people. The lady's heart began to throb. Her head started to whirl. This man she'd hated before all others up until a few moments ago. And then another emotion had taken control of her. It was not love. It was not even admiration. It was a wild desire to abnegate herself, annihilate herself in the man who stood before her. To become his bondwoman, the slave of his controlling will. She drove the nails into her palms and made one desperate effort to escape. One desperate bid for victory. I was just going to the opera when you arrived, Rupert. Won't you join me? Come to my box. Come to my box with me, Rupert. I think not. Actually, the opera's a bit of a bore, isn't it? There are some operas which are not bores, my dear Rupert. La Bohème is extraordinarily beautiful and important. some slight ills, if only to recognize the very sweetness of life without them. And ills there were, but they were twisted to his advantage. I mean, after all, you've got to hand it to old Rupert. I mean, my goodness, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth if ever anybody was. Did you hear about him at the hotel at Elbon? He's in Ayla Bar and he has a broken ankle, you see. I mean, really. He's at this hotel and who should walk in but the Countess Gabrielle de Volbe. Oh, no. My dear, yes. That's how it all started. Good heavens. Yes. Nothing at all seems to touch him. I mean, you remember the newspaper business about him in the... Oh, where was he? Oh, yes. On the in on, my dear, what does it matter? Anyway, this epidemic broke out, and there was a Rupert running hither and thither looking after the sick, I mean. Oh, he was such a hero. He seemed immune from serious danger. Everything he touched turned into gold. He reveled in pleasure and radiated happiness until the fifth year. There were but five days to go when Orange, in search of solace, ventured into a London rainstorm on February the 28th. There was cash in his pockets, rich clothes upon his back, but his heart was like ice. London seemed strange, unfriendly, was cold and alien, and he could find no one to speak with, no one to share his fears, until... Bad 
quite day for a gentleman like you to be wandering about, isn't it? You fancy a drink, do you? You could get one at my place, if you were mine. This way. poison. In America just now, of course, you wouldn't be allowed to accept a drink. I wouldn't be allowed to give you one. They've got prohibition over there. Prohibition. <laughs> what? It? Susan Annis. What in heaven's name? You. You in my home. You. Home? This? Huh. Hobble. Tom? Tommy? Of all the women in London, I pick you. Tommy! <laughs> I asked for this, prayed for this, to see you humiliated. He'll have money, Tommy, a lot. Take it, and don't be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> of London, a drunken man who'd really enjoyed his night out stepped over a body lying half in the gutter without comprehending what it was. The gutter ran outside the house occupied by Mrs. Annis. The body was that of a man. He'd been thrown from the second floor. His pockets were empty. He was Rupert Orange, and he was dead. It was five years to the day since the meeting on the River Thames embankment. Here I go, singing low. Bye -bye. Midnight is presented every Friday night at half past nine by Biotex, the new soak and pre wash powder. RelicRadio.com presents tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked, stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual. This is Strange Tales. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this Sunday. We're going to hear from the sealed book this week. 
series that aired over mutual stations from March to September of 1945. 26 episodes were produced. Our story today is from August 26th, 1945. It's titled, Time on My Hands. The Seal Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly... The great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a man who was down and out and was willing to do anything for money. A tale titled, Time on My Hands. Here is a tale, Time on My Hands, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. Our story begins in one of the cells of the state penitentiary. Joe Martin, his face white and tense, is speaking to Father Dolan. Father Dolan, I'm not faking insanity, I'm not. Everything I've told him is true. Look, you can make him see why it can't be tonight, why it mustn't be tonight. Even if it's only put off until tomorrow, that'll be all right. Then, then, then I'll know that what Mr. Benedict said won't come true. Listen, this is how it happened. It all started late one night last September. It was awful cold. It had been getting darker and darker all afternoon. Then, just about midnight, the storm started. <laughs> Can't sleep here in the park, Joe. Not with all this rain coming down. Yeah. Oh, it's really pouring now, and I still ain't raised the price of a flop. Uh, oh, I just about sell myself to the devil for the price of a bed. I... Hey, hey, look. Eh? What's that you're picking up? Uh, it's a fountain pen, see? I can hock it. Maybe I can get the price of a pen. Ah, it's only a two-bit pen. You couldn't get a cent for it. Well, I'm going to have a try. What can I lose? Okay. And I'm heading downtown. I'll see you later. Yeah. If I don't kill over first. Oh. Coming down so hard, you can't see more than a couple of feet ahead. Oh, my feet is wet. I feel hot and cold. Hot and cold. Oh, here's Rand's pawn shop. Come on. Oh, no. Closed. No luck. Never no luck. Try Morris's place. 
right along here somewhere. I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here it is. Oh, oh, oh close to him. Why does this have to happen to me? Arnold's hawk shop has got to be open. It's not... I can't see his window. Coming down so hard, I... He's got to be open. Nobody's lucking me that bad. Be open, be open, be open. Oh, closed. Oh, he's closed too. Now what? I gotta keep walking around. I'll keep over. No one inside. I'm all alone. No friends, no place. No. What's that? Hog shop? Never noticed this place before. Must be a new one. Here, I, I gotta get in. Gotta get some dough for this pen. I gotta. Must be the boss up there in the back of the shop working on his books. Yeah. Uh, uh. Good uh, evening. Co- oh, oh, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, no, no on the street, huh? Why, yes, I am. But I've been in this business quite a number of years. Quite a number. You, uh, have something you desire to pawn? Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 this, this here fountain pen. May I see it, please? Oh, sure. It's a fine pen. Writes good, too. Hmm. I'm afraid I wouldn't be interested in that. Well, well look, mister, c- couldn't you let me have something on it? I'm sorry, but this pen is worthless. Yeah, just my luck. Uh, possibly you have something else you can pawn. Something else? Me? Well, I got time on my hands. Time. Nothing to do with it. Nothing but starve and freeze. Ah, then perhaps we can do business after all. Huh? In fact, I can make you a very handsome offer. If you're prepared to sell, say, five years of your life. Sell five years of my life? Look, how can you buy five years of my life? Oh, it's very simple. Our firm, shall I say, does it all the time. You merely sign an agreement and the five years are deducted from your lifespan. You mean... You mean I'd, I'd die five years sooner than I should? Yes, but then think how unhappy your years are. Well? Who are you, mister? Why do business under a dozen different names? Benedict is as good a name as any. Now come. Are you willing to sell five years of your life? I'm prepared to offer you, shall we say, a thousand dollars a year. A thousand dollars a year? Yes. Five thousand dollars in all. Think of it. With that money, you can live as you've always wanted to live. Yeah, yeah, I know, but but five years. What will they mean to you? Cold, hunger, wet feet. Yeah, wet feet. (laughs) Sure would feel good to have a new pair of shoes on my feet. You got the money here, mister? Yes, I always pay in cash. Five thousand bucks, huh? Sure, sure, why not? Why not, indeed. I'll have to look your record up in my files. Uh, what is your full name, please? Uh, Joseph Henry Martin. Let me see. Joseph Henry Martin. You, you mean you got my my name in that file? Why, yes. We try to keep our records complete. Uh, you were born December the twenty second, nineteen hundred and twelve. Yeah. Your father's name was Richard. Your mother's name was Margaret. Yeah, you, you you're right. Very well, Mister Martin. Your record is satisfactory, and we can do business. If you'll just sign this form, please. Yeah, mister. Oh, oh th- this line, huh? Yes, please. Your name in full and the date. Joseph Henry Martin, October 5th. Yeah. There. Yeah. What about the dough? Of course. If you will just feel in the right-hand pocket of your coat. Money! A handful of $500 bills. Please count them to make sure the sum is correct, Mr. Mark. Yeah, yeah, be glad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's all there. 5,000 bucks. It's been a pleasure to do business with you, Mr. Martin. Good oh, night. Five th- huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a mutual. Good night. 5,000 bucks. Ah, I'm rich. Oh, am I going to have me a time? Come on, service, service. How about some service in this hotel? I want a room, see? No, 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 no. I want a suite. The best suite you got, Mac. With a bath. <laughs> Never mind how I look. Never mind. I got those, see? <laughs> $500 bill. Now, how do I get that suite, don't I? Don't 
Six suits, brother, that's what I said. I want six suits, tweed, like them in a winter, only with more color in them, see? When a guy's got dough, he wears tweeds. <laughs> and I got dough, see? Any fur coat you like, baby, just name it. Go ahead, name it. That one? <laughs> okay, mister, wrap it up. Go on, you heard what the lady said. But one day, a little more than three months after Joe had come into his newfound wealth, he was shocked to learn that he was overdrawn at the bank. It seemed the $5,000 was gone. Even more, he owed a hotel bill of $400. Late that night, Joe skipped his hotel and took up residence at a cheap boarding house. One by one, his possessions began to go. You mean only... F- what? Ten bucks for these suits? Look, look, they're worth 60 anyway. Look, Mac, I paid a tail... Ten bucks, huh? Okay, let me have it. Only a dollar for my hat? One buck? But... Well, I... Gotta have a bed tonight, so Okay. Say, hey, bud, can you help a fellow that's down and out, huh? Huh? Can you help me out with a, a little something, mister, huh? Just a little... T- hey, you louse. Didn't even look at me. Midnight ain't even got the price of a flop yet. Raining again. Always at rain. Four months ago, I had 5,000 bucks. Now I ain't got a dime. I ain't even got anything left to pour. Nothing. Not even a... Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure I am. Why didn't I think of that before? Benedict's pawn shop. I'm still young, I got plenty of time left. I'm gonna see Benedict. And now to continue the story, Time on My Hands, as it is written in the sealed book. Soaked to the skin, his shoes leaking, Joe Martin trudged through the rain toward Benedict's pawn shop. He peered anxiously ahead as he approached it. Just a little further and I'll be there. He's, he's got to be open. He just got Yeah, yeah. There's a light in his window. He is open. evening. Oh, Mr. Benedict. Remember me? Certainly. You're Joseph Henry Mark. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Look, h- how'd you like to buy another five years of my life on me, huh? Uh, just a minute, please, while I get your record from the file. Uh, you can bet this time I ain't gonna waste my dough. Ah, here we are. Joseph Henry Mark. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, is it a deal for another five years, huh? Uh, yes, we can do business. Ah, good. Uh, however, Mr. Martin, I can only pay you $500 a year this time. $2,500 in all. $2,500? Oh, but look, you, you gave me 5000 for the first five years. Yes, I know, but uh, we're rather heavily stocked just now. $2,500? I don't know. I, I was kind of counting on, on, on buying a farm with the 5000 well, perhaps we can do business another time, when conditions are more favorable. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, let me think it over. Do so, by all means. It's quite all right. My clothes are soaked. My feet are wet. 2,500 bucks, I could... All right. All right, it's a deal. If you'll just sign your name and the date on this form, as before. Okay. Joseph Henry Martin. Uh, what's the date? January the 18th. And put down the time, Joseph. Two minutes past two. Yeah, two minutes past two. Hey, yeah. Fine. Hey. Hey, you can feel a door in my pocket again. Yeah. Yeah, 10, 15, 20, 25. 2,500, yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, hey, maybe I better sell you another five years, huh? I, I could get a much better farm for 5,000, you know. Sorry, but I'm afraid we're not interested in any further purchases. Why not? You have no more time to sell. No. No more? What do you mean? According to my records, with the sale you've just made, deducted from your lifespan, you have just two more hours to live. Two hours? Yes. You're now due to die at three minutes after four o'clock in exactly two hours. No, nah, no, nah, that's a mistake. It must be. No, no, Mr. Martin. I have your record right here, and our records are never wrong. Then what did you let me sell you the five years for? My dear Mr. Martin, you asked me to buy them. Yeah, but what good is a 2500 not to take back your door and give me back my five years? I regret to say that there are no exchanges. There's got to be one, you hear me? I'm one of you. You're going to give me back my five years, or aren't you? I should like to oblige, but it's against our policy. Oh, it is, is it? Maybe this will help you change your mind, huh? I should put down that knife if I were you, Mr. Martin. Put it down when I get back my five years or no sooner. Do I get them? I'm sorry to say no. No, I take that! <laughs> what are you standing there smiling for? I stabbed you! You gotta fall! Fall, do you hear me? You... You're not even bleeding. No, Mr. Martin, I'm not even bleeding. <laughs> you better pick up your money and go. Yeah, but look, look, don't you see I... Look, give me a break, will you, mister? You have one hour and 58 minutes left now. I'm sorry, Mr. Martin. Oh, you can't let me die like this. You can't do it. You, you got to give me more time, please. Well, I think we could arrange for you to have more time if you care to sell your soul. Huh? Sell my soul? It's of trifling value, of course, but my firm has a certain use for such things. My soul, huh? But I, I never thought very much about it. Never had any use for it myself, I guess. Few people do. It's yeah. superfluous at best. What? what was that? Merely the clock striking the quarter hour. It's now a quarter past two. Quarter past two. All, all, all right, I, I'll sell. Where do I sign? Well, unfortunately, in this matter, your signature would not be binding. There's only one way I could be certain of getting my property when the time comes. What? What? What way is that? You'd have to, shall we say, remove some person from this life. You mean, you mean kill someone? Exactly. And in return, you shall have the balance of the victim's life. You may be fortunate enough to find someone who has 30 or 40 years to live. Just think, all that time would be yours. Yeah, yeah, but, but to have to kill somebody... Oh, you don't have to. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, but if I don't... But, uh... Die in two hours. One hour and 47 minutes, to be exact. No. No, I couldn't kill no one. Even if it means I die tonight. I can't do it, you hear me? I'm getting out of here. Three minutes. 
I, I gotta get out of the storm. There's a bar room. I could use a drink. What do you have? Uh, double whiskey. Keep them coming. Let me have another. Say, pal, you already put away a bottle. Don't you think you had enough for one night? Look, look, you just keep setting them up. I'm paying for it, Ellie. Okay, it's your funeral. Don't say that. All right, all right. I didn't mean nothing by it. Last time I'll, I'll ever hear a clock strike. Only three minutes. Three minutes. Did you say something? No, no. What's, oh, what's that? What's what? What's that? That, that, that clock ticking. Where is it? Clock? There ain't no clock ticking in here. There is! Listen, guy, you, you had a couple too many, I guess. Okay, I, I can hear it, I tell you. It's ticking, ticking, ticking. Tell me, I've, I've, I've only got three minutes left. Look, fella, it's time you was going. I, I don't like the way you're talking. Yeah, yeah. Gotta get out of here. Gotta get away from that clock. To continue the story, Time on My Hands, as it is written in the sealed book. His heart pounding in his ears, Joe ran out of the bar and down the street, terror clutching his heart. Try as he would, he couldn't rid himself of one thought. The clock had just struck four. The end was fast approaching. Breathless, he came to a stop. Looked around wildly. Three minutes to live. Three minutes. No, no. Must be only two now. I, I don't want to die. I, I want to live. I want to live. I've got to do it. I've got to. Time is going so fast. It's too tempting. No, no, no. Here comes somebody. Uh, mister, mister, you, you got a match? Sure, yeah, sure. Hey, why are you looking at me like that? Oh, no, you're old. You're old. You, you must be over 70. Mm. Uh, yes, but... but you, ah, you're no good to me. I want someone with lots of life, man. Lots of life for me to live. You're mad. You're mad. Wait a minute. Here comes somebody else. Somebody young. I can, I can tell by the way he was. Somebody with years to live yet. It's my last chance. Hey, uh, hey, mister. You call me? Yeah, you, uh, you, you got the time? Yeah, sure. Exactly two and a half minutes after four. Uh, means I got 30 seconds left. 30, 30 seconds. Yeah, what are you doing with that knife? Oh, don't. Well, I... Don't! 
I've done this. I've, I've done what you said. I, I kill a man. I kill him, do you hear me? I, I kill a man. Yes, I know you have. I'm a murderer. But you're alive. And as you see, it's a quarter past four. Uh, I'm alive. And his time. I'm sure you'll put it to excellent use. Yeah. Take his wallet so as to get his name. Proof he I did it. His name is Frank R. Caldwell. Frank R. Caldwell. I'll look it up in the files. He's young. He wanted to live too, but I killed him. Frank R. Caldwell. Here it is. How much? How much time I got to live? Now, let me see. Hmm. His file expires on August 20th. August 20th? What year? This year. Th this year? Yes. You've received just seven months from him. Seven months? <laughs> you must be wrong. He, he was so young. I'm sorry, but seven months was all he had. Oh, no, no, he you can't. You'll find our records are quite correct. So your card will be removed from our files no. at no. ten minutes after 11 p.m., on August 20th. No, no, no. Ah, August 20th. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's what you've done to me. August 20th. Oh, no. August 20th. August 20th. August 20th. That's the man who stopped me. Who are you? Just a minute there. Yeah, that's the man, all right. He's the one that killed that poor boy. Yeah, come along, you. You're under arrest. August 20th, is there? Seven months. Just seven months. What you see, Father Dolan, he, he said I, I was going to die on August 20th. Oh, August 20th. So, so that's why it's got to be put off until tomorrow. Because today is the 20th, and if I go tonight, then he'll... he'll... 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. No. Sorry, Father Dolan. His time is up. You ready, Joe? Yeah. I yeah, sure wouldn't. I'm, I'm ready. It's time for me to go, isn't it? Just the time he said I'd go. So ends the tale, Time on My Hands, as it is written in the sealed book. As Joe was strapped into the electric chair, there was a look of terror in his eyes. It was not death that terrified him, but the thought of Mr. Benedict. Mr. Benedict, who would be waiting for him. And now, keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. The tale of a man who committed the perfect murder, only to discover that every murder must be paid for. The tale is titled, Death Laughs Last.
Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is written by Bob Arthur and David Kogan. That's our strange tale for this week. You can find more from The Sealed Book at relicradio.com alongside thousands of other old-time radio shows, more from Strange Tales, our shoutcast stream, and everything else Relic Radio. You can donate through the website as well if you'd like to help support this and all of the shows. It's how the show keeps coming to you every week. Thanks to those who have. Thanks for joining me today. Talk again next Sunday with another episode of Relic Radio's Strange Tales.